My name is John Crow. I'm a data analytics manager for Unilever Ireland. So I think everybody here is probably aware of Unilever Ireland. We're a brand manufacturer for both the FMCG and food services sector. So today I'm going to focus on FMCG and how the advances in data and analytics have affected the management of uh, FMCG company. Um, so just a quick snapshot on what I do. So I've, I'm in data and analytics. So I don't know, has anyone here ever watched Friends? You know Chandler Bing? Welcome to my world, because nobody knows what he does, and it's the same with me when I try and explain what I do to people. So I'm not going to bore you with the details with that. I will just uh, go into start with just continuing on from Fiona. Yes, we are at unprecedented rates of change. So we are part of a VUCA world. Uh, if you've heard of the term VUCA, it's a term that uh, describes a system or a sector as volatile uncertain, complex, and full of ambiguity. So I think we can all agree with that. So I just want to loosen everybody up a little bit here. So I want everybody to stand up, please. So just a, just a quick test here to see if you agree with this. So, we're at, so nod your heads if, you, if you're familiar with VUCA and you understand it. Do everybody, does everybody know VUCA? Yeah, right, so uh, I just want you to read this uh, quote that I've paraphrased from a very famous and well-published ind industry publication. So I'll, I'll read it out loud anyway. We are living in the most complex and rapid changing times. The pace of technological innovation like never before is challenging the way we operate. So I think this is aligned with Fiona, the rate of change. We, we have to be aligned with this and that pace is exponential at the moment and unprecedented. So if you are part of the F FMCG or even food services sector, if you agree this affects you, please sit down. Okay, what about finance? Anyone here in finance? If you agree with this term? I didn't think anyone in finance might be here. What about supply chain management? Agri-foods? Okay, everybody. Well. If, if I haven't got your sector and you agree with this term, please sit down because I think, yeah, I think it is, it is a part of our world. It's a part of every industry, every sector that we operate in. But the next question I want to ask you is when? When do you think this quote has come from and what publication? Would you be surprised if I, if I told you it wasn't this century or even the last century? from Scientific American, September publication in uh, 1868. So it's 150 years to, to this uh, date already. So if you don't believe me, it's explaining the rate of change, advances in technology driven by the introduction of oil to the Industrial Revolution. Still a bit skeptical, skeptical. here's a screenshot of the actual publication and the paragraph that I paraphrase from. So I think in modern day, we kind of forget the rate of change of technology that has happened in the past. And we do have to remember that. Yes, we are in unprecedented times, but we don't take ownership to the VUCA world. The world has always been VUCA, and we have to learn from that to put it into context. So just a very simple trend of the, um, so the, the, the gross national product, or the NNP, net national product of Britain, from 1200 right up to present day. You can see there is a, a certain exponential rate change in the late 1700s into the 1800s. That was sparked by the introduction of the locomotive engine, the introduction of electricity and light. Think of how that changes the mindset of organizations, even being able to turn on a reliable automatic light and work continuously during the dark. So again, that innovative entrepreneurial spirit like the founders of my own company, William Lever of the time, you can see the second trend is very similar. And that is the rate of submissions of patents for designs to the English Patent Office from 1600 right through to 1850. And you can see any spark in technology, any spark in innovations leads to an explosion. If we bring it to present day and align more to Fiona's rate of change um, analogy. 
I go to Hal Varian, who is the chief economist within Google. Now, this is stark, and this is a real stark reminder of how much things have changed over the last 20 years. So, from the dawn of civilization right up to the beginning of this millennium, there was only five exabytes or five billion uh, gigabytes of data created by the human race. We do that every two days now, since the introduction of social media, YouTube. They, it's, there's an explosion. So this is predicted by 2020 that the rate of change in data demand and storage uh, supply is going to increase 50 times fold. This is known as the Cambrian explosion. So we can structure, we can split that into maybe two or three types of struct our data structures. So there's the structured data that we use in business every day. So that's your Excel spreadsheets, your relational databases then unstructured data, that's everything else. From this PowerPoint to the emails you send and then into human data, social media and online data distribution. To put it into context, in the, in the business world, we have, we, create, we have created 0 0.09 zettabytes of data. I was showing this to my uh, son Jack yesterday, who's seven, and I was explaining to him, do you know what a zettabyte is? It's nearly the biggest number in the world. There's only one bigger than that, which in terms of that is called a yottabyte, and it's a septillion. So it's a one with 24 zeros after it. And Jack said to me, no, Daddy, you're wrong. There's a Google. But I said, what is a Google? I didn't even know what a Google was. He said, a Google, a Google is a one with 100 zeros. His teacher had told him it, because they, they, were, they were learning about binary coding in primary school. So it's amazing, yeah. So. And that's only used in astrophysics for light year travel. But we have to look at data. How are we going to use data? So this, this chart on the right-hand side. So we've got less than, uh, less than 0.09% zettabytes in structured business data. Then we put on top of that machine learning data, sensor data, everything from RFID to the Internet of Things. That increases to nearly five zettabytes. And then we put on top of that of the huge unstructured uh, minefield that is human data. So that's tweets, YouTube uploads and downloads. There's a significant amount of data there that we have to understand. In terms of the evolution, what, what we are entering into is the digital ecosystems. This is where traditional sector boundaries and borders have been, have been great, and we're merging into what we're, we're talking about, ecosystems or digital ecosectors. So it is predicted by 2025, this could be worth roughly $60 trillion to the global economy. That's going to be 30% of the global economy. So this is uh, business to business, and business, uh, business to, to consumer transactions that have eliminated the traditional transaction arm of business. So this is everything is online transactions. But from an FMCG perspective, we want to look at this as a living organism. And if we can unlock the other ecosystems, whether it's travel and hospitality, housing and dig or digital content, and have an end-to-end -end user uh, experience for a customer and become a customer-centric FMCG sector, we can unlock another five to six billion euro within FMCG and food and drinks to a greater extent within the Irish economy by 2025. So to, to understand this, to utilize it, take, it adva take advantage of it, Unilever have developed what we call our data analytics insight factory. So it's us where we take all of the chaos of the human data, sensor data, and business data, and try um, make sense of it. So we try and collate it. We try and tidy it up. In, in data, data analytics is called what's known as a data swamp, everything that's out there. For example, I, I um, have safely uploaded in my Google account a copy of James Joyce's Ulysses, 538 gig gigabytes worth of memory. To upload a video of a cat playing a keyboard on YouTube might be 1,000 times more memory of that. So again, you have to look at it into the context of what mem what's data out there in the cloud is important to you and what isn't. 
and keeping with the the subject of animals. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody here has watched a YouTube anim or animal video, have you? Whether it's a cat falling off a window ledge, playing a keyboard, hamsters, or whatever. There's more data used for animal videos alone in, in YouTube than Unilever use for their entire, entire global operation. So it's staggering. So we're talking about a, a company with some of the biggest brands in the, in the world, from Ben & Jerry's and HB Ice Cream to uh, Noor, Hellman's, Purcell & Comfort. Um, we, we're talking about billion euro brands and we don't use half as much uh, data, data storage than animals, funny animal videos on YouTube. So I don't know, is there any pet food manufacturer, is there anyone in the pet food sector here? Well, look at you. I, I'm gonna try and explain how we would try and gather insights from that. So our insights factory is based on what we call analytic centers of excellence. So we've got nine in total. The first one is our people data center. So that's where we try and utilize the, um, the, the data that's out there in the cloud. So anything, if there was a query clicked or a tweet made or complete made, complaints made about our products out there on the web, that we know how to extract it, how to manipulate it and transform it into useful information. We've also got a marketing insight center of excellence where we use a mix of traditional marketing mix modeling, modeling and more qualitative techniques in collecting data on consumer and shopper segmentation to try, try and understand who our consumers are. Also analytics and CD, uh, customer development. This is where we try and understand data and analyze how we can uh, optimize the revenue management of our products, right through from our pricing and promotional strategy to the terms we have with our customers. And our content, this is a really exciting one. So this is where we have a, a center of excellence team that develop our own core content for third party websites on our own websites that we use and trying to understand what, what a consumer wants to uh, engage in, what we need to do to be able to uh, reach out to those customers and uh, most importantly, to activate and nurture them. From a people foresight perspective, this is where we try to look at the psychology of our brands. Our brands aren't all about core analytics and data. We have to look at the intangible end of things, the tone of our brands, the emotions of our brands and how they relate to our consumers. And our innovations, similar to within Kerry, we try and get a very uh, quick lean response to getting uh, an idea or a brief from our consumers and our internal teams and try and get it to an on-the-shelf ready product within uh, a speedy time frame. And uh, lastly, our Unilever Foundry. So this is founded on the, the entrepreneurship uh, principles of our founder, William Lever, where we try to, as a multinational company, react like we're a startup, be agile like we're a startup, and not have as much red tape and bureaucracy of a global company. So we work with a lot of uh, uh, startup companies. So we've got a very effective collaborative partnership with a tech, tech, our tech startup companies and Dogpatch Labs here in um, Dublin. And we also work with uh, the academic industry. So we've close long-term relationships with UCD and Trinity MBA programs and postdoctoral research groups within DIT, and we've got some really exciting outputs from that. So uh, what I could say is the core outputs that we look at, I'm gonna focus on key trends that we found collaborating within our centers of excellence. One is our new consumer is a connected shopper. It is predicted by 2020 that 70% of the world population will have a smartphone. What does that mean? So that's crazy. We're talking about 4 billion people with smartphones, access to the internet. From our food and refreshments perspective, it's trying to understand the changes in the, the uh, experience of even making a dinner. What is that occasion like anymore? So we have uh, understood that 
um, our, our consumer, that dinner occasion is linked dramatically with that connected world. So people are YouTubing how they make their dinners on how important we try to link in, how important our products are to that journey of making their product. They're tweeting the experience of eating a, a meal out in a cafe or a restaurant. So again, it's looking at the trends of the connected shopper and how we have to move with those times. Channel fragmentation shift. They increase focus on out-of-home experiences, e-commerce, and discounters, and a de 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 decreasing trend in large format stores. We have to look at that and understand how we can engage with that, and how, when in store, when in with these new fragmented channels, how can we disrupt? How can Unilever disrupt when a, a, a shopper or consumer is in these ch new shifted channels? So that's using digital enhancements to disrupt walking along the aisles with our traditional shopper, shopper marketing techniques. And then understanding our customer within our uh, B2B relationship with all of the retailers, our, our new channels within out of home experience, discounters, drugstores, and also our traditionals in, in multiples and convenience, there is a huge shift. These customers are changing their business models. You walk into any service station now, it's more uh, a, food, a food service station than anything else. Convenience stores have shifted to locating coffee shops within their own uh, retail outlet. So we have to understand how can we utilize the, uh, these new channel shifts. So within our data analytics insights, we have got a very uh, extensive toolbox uh, ranging from the basics, we, we do not forget the basics, from the core fundamentals of data management and statistical uh, modeling, right through to more um, sophisticated advanced areas of simulation, optimization, neural networks that would move into deep learning, machine learning, and the dreaded word artificial intelligence. But we see within uh, Unilever that this is the future. The, these are the techniques that we need to utilize. So if we look at it from just a quick ex example, this is a basic agent-based simulation model that I've built on data, on analytical reports, and insights from our core centers of excellence. So if we look at it, this is just a, a, a focus on, it could be five generic core urban, urban regions within Ireland. So it could be Belfast, Dublin, Cork, Galway, Waterford, for example. We've got three competitors, our green, blue, and red customers. This is, a, this is run as an input for an ice cream company. So we're looking at maybe channeling out of home impulse. You can see here why the model was playing. I don't think it's playing at the moment, it was playing. It is, yeah, brilliant. Any inputs here we can look at. So we're treating a kid as an influencer. This could be an influencer within, multi within social media, for example. Um, we've gathered statistics and waiting to show how a key influencer can change the demand of a product, the, the shift from, from a competitor product to yours. We're looking at promotional volume, looking at our marketing insights on our analytics and CD centers of excellence to really understand the promotional strategies, the performance of our strategies, have we got the right product mix? Have we got the right product and price architecture to affect it? And even the, the memory of our consumer to understand what is happening within that rate of change. So even within our people foresight's uh, center of excellence, we really understand the, the consumer behavior and, and the triggers that will change and disrupt within that uh, environment. So if we look at it, just in summary, yes, we are part of a VUCA world, but it's always been a VUCA world. I think the biggest change that that has brought to the, to the world of FMCG and food and drinks at the moment is that is, uh, it is a lot smaller. Everybody is in connect, interconnected. Our shopper understands a lot more about our products and they can research between online and bricks and mortar. They can interchange their research and purchasing on a flick of a button. 
we are in the middle of a retail revolution and from a FMC brand manufacturer, we need to make sure that we are following those trends and that we are aligned. The fragmented channels, the focus on out of home experiences, the focus on the competition that discounters are bringing, we have to see how can we change our brands to, to utilize these new channel shifts. Through digital engagement, we need to know how we can disrupt a, a consumer. While they're in, in store shopping and when they're online, when they're on social media, if they're watching a, a sports game, we know, statistics say, that at least 70% of people watching the sports game at the moment, it's the only live TV program that they watch. But while they're watching it, they're tweeting, they're looking at social media, media they're looking at what their, their peers are saying. So we need to understand how can we link in our brands, our uh, um, channels within that. For example, our collaboration with the GA on our SureStats at the moment that has worked very effectively. We need to embrace data analytics. We need to understand this shift into digital ecosystems and how we can utilize it. It doesn't have to be sophisticated machine learning, but it's understanding that importance of data and how we travel that journey from gathering our data, changing it into information, and the most important part of, from that is utilizing that information into sustainable knowledge in the future. So thank you for your time.